this one. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Andy Goetz from the ESRF, and I'm not a crystallographer, so we're going to leave the, but the crystallographic world and the MX world, and I'm going to talk about the other fields and also represent a source, I think. Uh, tell, us what, tell you what we're doing at the source, yeah? uh, or planning to do, because this talk is about very recent work, and uh, so we're moving towards something which we hope will solve a number of the issues which have been raised here. So uh, before I start, well, I thought I would wanted to just show a few picture, pictures by uh, an artist who I discovered while I was pr uh, preparing this talk called Cynthia Gregg, who uh, works on ver various things, but this collection called Life Size, Life Size uh, reminded me of what we were doing here in a way that I'm going to give you a very uh, detailed account of what we're trying to do in terms of software. But at any point in time, you can take another step back and just look at the pictures or get, try and get the overall viewpoint of what we're working on. Uh, when I did contact her, if I could get her permission to use these pictures, and she said, uh, no problem at all, and checked out what we were doing and said it sounded very fascinating. <laughs> I don't know if she would say the same if she was here now. So just to remind you, ESRF, uh, European Synchrotron, uh, where are we today in terms of metadata? Uh, my rapid summing up is in MX, we're in a very good situation. Uh, but then for the rest, it's very, very, uh, I mean, some metadata is still collected manually, some of it's not collected, some of it's uh, very little of it's archived and so on. And that's what we're now trying to address. And we are in the... Uh, throws of doing a major upgrade of the source as well to get even more brilliant. And I don't know if Ludwig will like that, but anyway. Just to show you what we're dealing with in terms of raw data, this is the, uh, the last 12 months until June before the summer shutdown. You can see uh, the shutdowns are the, where you have no data. And we're dealing with, at the moment, one point, about 1.2 petabytes of raw data produced a year. And this is going up uh, as usual. What was interesting for me from this graph is uh, it's actually linear, it's not exponential. It uh, used to be exponential, but now it's more linear. And why is this? Because of all these detectors, a number of them come from the sponsor, of course, but uh, these are not our worst, let's say, uh, our most challenging detectors. <laughs> the most challenging ones come from, uh, from other suppliers, and we have to deal with all of these. That's why we have a lot of data and metadata. And we also have to deal with new detectors every year. Uh, and I think one issue that hasn't been touched upon yet, or I don't know if someone will, I won't have the time, is the whole issue of calibration. Calibration of these new detectors who have multiple panels are in 3D, have a lot more, uh, uh, bring on a lot of challenges uh, every year. And we keep on being faced with this. And that's also part of the metadata. So if you, if you look around what people mean when they say metadata, it's very hard to come up with a, very, uh, with a common definition. And there are a few interesting quotes I found uh, on, on, on the web is often we just talk past each other because we don't mean the same thing. Often uh, this generic term data about data is used. I tried that on my wife last weekend and she, because she wanted to know what the talk was about. And she, I, it just got this blank stare when I said data about data. It's not, an obvious, uh, it's not an obvious definition. So I've defined it, or we've defined it in the context of this project, is all data which is needed in addition to the raw data to analyze the data. So it's all about being driven, that high, high priority has been given to the analysis programs. And I think just aside, one of the reasons why metadata is badly defined is because if you look at this, uh, this, uh, this dictionary entry, uh, you could say every entry, the name of every entry is metadata. But on the other hand, you could also take all the entries and just use that as data. So I think metadata has this strange uh, kind of uh, dualities. It can be data for one person and metadata for another person. Whereas data, raw data, is very rarely metadata. So I think that's why there's this confusion, why we don't agree always. So I've identified three, uh, we've identified three classes of metadata, and the one that's uh, been picked up by the uh, two fingers there is the one that we're now trying to solve. The three classes that we're talking about are beamline and sample, everything that goes in to start your experiment, describing that. 
the experiment itself, everything that happens during the experiment, and then the results, which are usually the models that you're going to develop and then uh, to interpret what, is, what has been measured. Uh, the one that I pointed out there with the uh, arrow on it, this is the one that, I, that, that we will be dealing with here in this talk. So, and if you think of three classes of metadata, we basically talking about three different kinds of databases. There's the database which is on the beamline, the one that's on the left. Uh, this is often the beamline archive, could be your epics archive or your tango archive. And that's the one that's usually got the name of the VME in there, which has no signific uh, significance for the data analysis normally. That one has been heavily, uh, let's say, assisted by the Nexus class definitions. I think a lot of it came from how we're going to describe the entire instrument from an archiving point of view. What we're uh, now dealing with is the metadata for analyzing the data. And these are in databases like ICAT, this is the one that we're using, or ISPYB, which is another one that's been used on the MX beamlines. ISPYB is a bit between both of them. Yeah? And Nexus has defined some things there, but many things are not defined because it's dependent on analysis programs. And that's where we have to get a handle on things. And the third catalog, which I won't deal with, is the one that you know probably better, much better than I do, is the PDB type, uh, the ICSD, all these different uh, catalogs where you put your results in. But those are usually external to the sources. I would say, I mean, my own uh, reading of what we've been doing since 20 years is we don't manage metadata very well. And when I look at the other sources, I get a similar feeling as well. And when I hear you people, I get a similar feeling. I think the reason for that is that we've been trying to, we've left the job in the hands of the beamlines in the sense of most of the time, uh, the people who in my group who do the data acquisition know nothing about the analysis and are never going to analyze the data. The people who um, analyze it usually say, we depend on what's recorded. And the beamline scientist is so busy or has, I mean, they have so much to do, you can't expect them. I mean, I, I think the 20 years has just shown us they're not sufficiently resourced and sufficiently, uh, let's say it's not their main job, is to define these kind of metadata standards and to make sure that this is complete and from a computing aspect, this is well managed. So I think it's been, uh, I mean, we've given the job or re relied on the wrong people. And what we need to do is now to join forces. It has happened where you have a number of beamlines who have the critical mass, like in MX at uh, ESRF, there's enough uh, interest there and resources so that you can address the problem in a complete way. But for all the other techniques, which is the one that, we, uh, that I'm trying to address uh, in this talk, I mean, it's often one person or one person and a few postdocs and that, and the communities are very, the user communities are very heterogeneous. Yeah. So the new approach is to say that we're going to do this from a, from a global point of view. We're going to do this for all beamlines. This means that uh, the computer guys like myself and people in my team are going to come, are going to build a solution, and this solution will be then put on the beamlines. This will uh, define a number of things which are common, and then ask for the scientists to provide the information that's lacking. So in a way, it's a, it's a centralized approach, but getting the information locally. And uh, the results of that are as follows up to now. First of all, I can, uh, we've got a list of requirements, if you like. The requirements are to collect metadata for all beamlines, instead of saying, let each beamline uh, collect their own metadata. Uh, we have to store this metadata forever, because there's no reason not to do that, and make it available via a permanent identifier like DOI for people to use. And this will allow us to offer more services, which I'll come to later, and even provide uh, the management with the possibility of defining the data policy for all beamlines as well. We have a second uh, remit, if you like. It's uh, if moving to advanced metadata management, and this is the case of MX. And there's certain experiments who can also go into that area where the technique is so well defined that often you can imagine doing this, uh, doing much more than you're doing for everyone. And for this, uh, there's a talk tomorrow, which is by uh, uh, Gordon, Gordon Leonard, who will be talk on this at this um, at this workshop. And the word there is often called ISPYB, but ISPYB is just the technology or the implementation. Gordon will talk about the metadata needs as well.
So I won't talk about MX. What we've done has been built up all entirely on um, existing standards, so we didn't want to reinvent anything. We haven't reinvented Nexus nor HDF5. We took an existing metadata catalog from SDFC. Uh, we have ISPYB, and of course, where things overlap with the SIF format, we will use that as well. This slide uh, summarizes everything that we've done and how it works. So if you look over here, it's not very, uh, uh, let's say, the writing's a bit small, so you'll have to read the slides afterwards. But basically, we constrain on a site-wide basis the definition of metadata. Then we link these definitions. Of course, we add definitions when they're missing. We link these definitions to what's uh, on the beamline or in the environment. Then during the experiment, this metadata is collected. And finally, it's ingested into an HDF5 file, which is given to the user, the master file. I'll come back to that. Uh, eventually, it'll go into an e-logbook. This is not done yet. And then goes into the metadata catalog as well. So it's all, this approach can be applied to all beamlines. Uh, you can have also the algorithms as well, how it works. The flowchart is basically we install some software on the beamline. We uh, ask the scientists what metadata do they, do they need. We show them what's available already, what we've already got uh, predefined. We add the missing uh, information, put it back in the global definition so it's available for everyone. And then we configure this on the beamline. This is done with a number of um, tools with graphical user interfaces. Over here, you see everything that's defined in ICAT. Uh, all of the Nexus classes over here. And you drag and drop the Nexus classes into the global definition and then link that to where it's stored in the database. This, using a tool like this and a global configuration file is everyone starts off from the same point. And secondly, you're constraining the user not to invent things that are, that they don't exist already. If you just zoom on this, you can see, you should be able to read all of these in the slides, and you can see uh, how this has been used on the real example at the ESRF. And today, where are we today? Today we have a number of um, global definitions, and we're extending this for specific techniques. So uh, this is microbeam radiotherapy, tomography, scanning, measurement generic scanning. So this is really only the beginning, and this will be extended. The idea is to extend this to all the beamlines. Uh, once you get to the beamline, you, you configure the beamline based on what is defined in the configuration file of what, what uh, metadata are already defined for the site. And then uh, during the experiment, this is recorded and sent to an HDFI file as well as to ICAT. And at any time afterwards, you can regenerate this file if someone needs it. One thing that's key to this whole thing, and that's where we uh, it's, uh, I sort of differ with when I see people talking a lot about image formats or that, the headers in image files uh, are, not, are not sufficient at all. There's a lot of the context of what makes a data set. And, uh, and if you look at other techniques, they have much, much more varied ways of collecting data. They do multiple scans, sub-scans, in the scan, they do uh, calibration runs and things like that. All of this contextual information cannot be put in a single image header file. So you need a global file to do that. And there the scan is really the key concept that defines what is a data set. It also has to be very flexible as well. You have to be able to mix multiple techniques in the same file. Uh, because people are inventing new techniques, the techniques which are, exist only on one beamline, and I don't think we can expect international standards on those. So we're going to have to be flexible in accepting uh, and defining groups of data which don't exist elsewhere. This is, for instance, uh, the input we got from the nano, nano beamline, where they were working on um, holography tomography, where they take multiple... Uh, um, tomography uh, data sets at four distances, and then they combine that together. So the guy says, the scientist wants this information that's on here, wants this as metadata. Uh, I think this is very specific to the way they do hollow tomography, and you can't expect this to be now part of some standard or anything. But you have to put this in the file, and you have to make this also available. So this is the kind of data that we're dealing with, and where I think uh, 
we get, this, will be, this kind of flexibility will be required on many beamlines and uh, on all sites as well. If you look at tomography, what we've got here is these things again are all, this, all the information that's required for the data analysis and very specific to these data analysis programs. So nothing that can be, that it'll be hard to make an international standard out of that. Uh, if you look at what they're doing in radiotherapy, they don't have data analysis programs, they don't analyze the data, they uh, have patients and they have to keep a protocol of certain parameters. These have to also be stored as metadata. This can all be captured with this system. There's a generic scan which allows us to treat any kind of multi-axis scan. Um, we can measure, uh, include dynamic data as well because metadata is, was initially defined as static data during the experiment but there's a lot of dynamic data which needs to be captured as well. This is captured in the measurement. So once we get to the beamline, there's a lot of shovel work to do to make this uh, hook up everything that we've got. Uh, here you can see the setup for on the right hand side, uh, no left hand side. This is what's been defined on the beamline. So it's the, uh, the scientist said from this technique, I need this and this metadata out of the global configuration. And on the left hand side, you get the, uh, this is the description of the beamline hardware. And by dragging and dropping uh, elements across, you link up the definition with where the source of the data is. And then during runtime, it just gets a trigger and says start of scan, take metadata, and this goes into the file. And you get a list of uh, entries in an HDF5 file. And if you drill down in those entries, you find, uh, you find your, all of your metadata. Uh, our current status is we have this running on two beamlines and work is started, uh, started on two more. We're addressing hollow tomography, nanofluorescence, nanodiffraction, and these techniques. And um, the next beamlines want to do spectroscopy, full field diffraction. I mean, the list of techniques I can see is going to be in the hundreds by the end of this. Yeah? Something which is going much beyond what just talking about a single technique. Yeah? Uh, we have estimated, based on this, how much metadata we think we're going to generate at the ESRF. Uh, at the moment, our estimate in terms of the size of the database, based, uh, it's a rough estimate because we're going from a single experiment, oh, let's say six months of data collected on one beamline all the time, we come up with 120 gigabytes per year for the, all the experiments at the ESRF, which is a very modest figure and there's no financial reason why we can't store that forever. Uh, and this has triggered the discussion at the ESRF of um, the metadata policy. This has always been a very painful, still is very painful, and hasn't con we haven't come to a conclusion yet, but now that we've got a handle on all the metadata at the ESRF, uh, there's no reason not to actually now come up with this metadata policy, which will say which metadata are available for everyone. Uh, and so we're going to have to take this injection, we're going to have to work on this and come up with uh, a site-wide policy which will, has been done at ISIS, has been done at ILL, but uh, to my knowledge only Elettra, I don't know if other synchrotrons have one, but uh, we're going to, there's a pledge by the directors to do this during the next, uh, during phase two, that there will be a data policy for, for all data. The metadata is definitely the key to any kind of improvements we want to offer, any kind of services we want to offer, because none of these things can be automated if we don't have the metadata. Uh, and, and I think the, the challenge is collecting the metadata, but also doing the calibration as well. This has to be done before the experiment, or just, I mean, very close to when you want to analyze the data. Uh, so all of these kind of extensions to data services will depend on having metadata. And we, in a way, we block today because we can't offer, we can only offer it on an individual basis, but not on a site-wide basis. Uh, one of the services we were uh, proposing to offer was called data analysis as a service, and we even prepared an EU proposal for this, for H2020, uh, but we were not successful. But just to show you the key role that metadata plays in this, is uh, you have all of this cloud structure here which allows you to access and do offer services, but everything goes via the metadata catalog. The metadata catalog is what will identify who has access to what data and what, what does the data mean. 
So without that, we can't offer the service as well. And finally, uh, how can this workshop help us? Uh, I, I think any kind of metadata schemes which are proposed here, we'll make sure that we can somehow, uh, we'll put them in our system to see that we can use them or see where we can find common ground. Uh, maybe a metadata policy uh, kind of template or proposal from the IUCR would help. Sometimes we end up having discussions of, should the title of the proposal be public? I mean, things like that. If, if international organizations say these things are standard, uh, then maybe it'll help uh, sites to come up with, uh, to get over these, these, these blocking points sometimes. I think w it would be great if a board like this, a wor uh, working group like this said, we must uh, curate raw data and not say you can do it if you want and so on be a bit more um, prescriptive on this. Uh, and of course, anything that's related to new techniques that are in crystallography, because I, I have the in impression here is very focused on the current techniques in MX, but if I think I see what people are doing with serial crystallography, with meshing and things like that, are these techniques also being covered by the, uh, the current definitions? I think these, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of evolution, I think, especially with the new sources. We're not the only ones doing this. I think Daisy, uh, I, I know Daisy's doing something similar. NSLS2 is also doing that. You heard from uh, Herb, similar thing. Uh, I, I really think the key to managing the metadata is having a master file uh, where all the metadata is put together with links to the raw data then. Uh, so it's not only dependent on what's coming out of the detector, but everything around it. Uh, we hope we're gonna now in 20 years time I'll be able to, well, I'll probably be retired by then, but uh, someone else will be able to say we've solved this problem. Uh, and uh, I just think um, it will probably be a challenge getting all the scientists, a, a majority of scientists to accept what we propose them in terms of definitions, because there's always people, I mean, things are, are when, when you start going into the details, it is much more complicated than just what a computer scientist thinks the problem is. Uh, uh, just the definition of energy in some experiments. It can be many definitions. Yeah. Okay, and the uh, credits are, uh, most of this work is the work of my colleagues. I'm just presenting it. And I'm very grateful also to have access to these photographs, which I find were, were quite pretty. Yeah. Okay, that was it. Hey, Andreas Foster from Dectris. Uh, so with uh, your uh, idea of basically for every experiment having all the metadata in one HDF5 file is then to take this one step further, the idea also to include all the data in HDF5 files or will they still be uh, stored in whatever way they come out of the detectors? The, the goal is to store the file, the uh, data, the raw data in HDFF files that we can use the linking mechanism right. from the master file. But uh, as you know from the ESRF, we have, a, uh, we have some very old data formats. We have a, a number of different data formats. Uh, those files can still be listed in the master file, but you won't be able to use HDF5 linking with it. All right. the, the, the concept that we've taken is we putting the system in place in parallel with the existing system. So it means that if people and data analysis programs can adapt uh, when, they, when, when, when they are ready, and you'll have both systems running in parallel. So you'll have the old files and the old way of storing metadata or not storing metadata plus in parallel the new way. Thank you. Camille uh, Dubek, Lance Florence. Um, just a brief comment about uh, this um, electronic logbook you, you were talking mm -hmm. about and the metadata which are actually not in the system which need to be introduced by the users mm -hmm. or the operator. There are better and worse organized people mm -hmm. and maybe it's worth of making such a kind of a table format for that with a checklist just to be sure that mm -hmm. in the time of experiments uh, all the needed metadata are stored because otherwise yeah, yeah. when the experiment is finished they may be lost. 
or yeah. some were lost in the yeah. papers. No, no, I agree. But I, I'm, I'm sometimes a bit, uh, I find it exasperating how much, um, how much uh, sloppiness is acceptable. You know, in a way, it, it seems strange if you if, if you with other systems, let's say more with older uh, uh, sciences or that things are often much more organized. You wouldn't imagine not starting the experiment with having put in all of that information. But at least the synchrotron, I think it's still a young uh, science, and and so sometimes I'm amazed at how people work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it works in the end, but with a lot of uh, human effort. Yeah. I sense that the ESRF senior management is taking a close interest. They will have asked you the question, what will success look like? What was your answer? Uh, the success would, uh, success would be uh, being able to uh, provide new services that we don't have today around data. And that for all beamlines, because at the moment it depends very much on which technique you're talking about and the people involved. So if you want to offer a, a cloud-based service or that, or you want to offer archiving, or you want to offer automatic processing, these services can only be offered if you have the correct metadata. So if, we, if we're doing those things which we're not doing today for all techniques, it means that we've actually, we have succeeded. Yeah. I imagined you might have answered avoiding failure. <laughs> uh, so measuring fa data. Failure, failure, I'd be very, I'm, I'm, uh, it's not so easy to define failure because if I define failure as a situation today, it would be a way of saying the synchrotron's not working, and it is working, and science is coming out of it. You can work like that as well. But the neutron sources would say every neutron mm. ends up supporting a publication. Yeah. Well, they, they Vladek just, they <laughs> gave us documentation that 99.7% uh, mm. of synchrotron yeah, yeah. X-rays for MX do not support yeah, publication. Yeah, yeah. So between these two extremes, mm. we have here a consistent, at least, metric for, mm. for what success yeah. would look like, which is yeah. that um, with the better metadata capture, and, and, and we also mm. insisted on raw data, mm. um, but it was softened, um, we would have a much more efficient usage of mm. the photons or neutrons that are produced. I would add one comment, which was the most, uh, the biggest sort of uh, sign of success was when the scientist, the beamline on which this has been deployed, said it's now become a pleasure to do experiments. <laughs> this is, <laughs> that meant that we had added value to what he was doing. Very good. Simon Carl, Southampton. Um, so you essentially, your approach uh, gives people a pick list uh, of metadata items. You've got the whole catalog and they can generate a shopping list for their mm. particular technique. Once you've done that many times, do you think you'd be able to pick out what are the core terms? So would, you, would you be able to come up with a core schema? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be very useful for people outside of the uh, yeah. central facilities world. Uh, mm. You live in a very constrained environment in central facilities. Yeah, when yeah, it goes out into institutions, things get messy. Really messy. Yeah. You think you've got a messy problem, and uh, <laughs> this is what happens okay. in universities. Um, and so, if we had something that we could mm. go on, that would be okay. very useful. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I think there's nothing. Uh, uh, I mean, this is all open. We can we can share this information. Yeah. 